Awesome. Hey, well, um, I just want to say thanks to Becky. And, um, actually, I just want to say thank you to everyone. You know, actually, all the ministries in church, most of us, we, you know, there's a break over Christmas, and, and um, a lot of ministries come to a halt, except for worship, you know, except for people on the computer, except for people on the sound desk, except for people doing children's stories or speaking up here, you know, that kind of thing. So I just want to say thank you for everyone that just keeps church running. And um, yeah, just just obeying whatever um, God gives them. So, so thank you. Um, this morning we're going to take communion, but I'm going to um, preach first. And and uh, I just I've had a uh, over the over the Christmas break. I've just taken time that I've just really wanted to reflect just on last year, year before, you know, so on. And I sort of I've. Ended up going a long way back, just looking over things and looking over. You get a good feel for the body of Christ when you've been in one place 30 odd years. And I think this is my 35th year here. I got saved here in Oxford Baptist. And if I'd, and if I'd gone from church to church to church, you know, whether I was moving or whatever I was doing or whatever, that, you know, it's... Then, then maybe I'd have a, a, a different view. I, I just don't know. But in my time here, I've seen a lot of people come and I've seen a lot of people leave for all kinds of reasons, geographical reasons, um, uh, spiritual differences, let's put it that way. Um, I've seen people uh, just, you know, families, work, whatever it is, take them away. I've seen people... Uh, just get jobs where it's been work all day Sunday, um, which is, you know, without trying to get religious about it or whatever, it doesn't work. I've seen people go through a season of it where you, where you might have to, you, you know, but, but that's very, very rare, and God's grace is on that. But often I've seen it as a way out of things. Man, I didn't even plan to go down this track <laughs> sort of thing. So I was just reflecting, you know, and, and, um, and what it's been like for Joy and I to raise our family here in Oxford, um, four kids, all born here, Joy born here. Um, I'm an import, as the locals would have said. Um, but I came here when I was 23, and I'm going to turn 63 this year, so I'm about to turn local for some of them, you know, so, so, uh, but the one thing I've seen is that when, when somebody, when somebody makes Jesus, absolutely everything in their life, they get through, and not only do they get through, like they have a, they have a peace and a joy and an understanding that's contagious. They have something in their heart that I want to be around. They have something in their heart that I want to do life with. That, I, that I, I've understood that fellowship is the glue. That to be able to say you love Jesus but you don't love your brothers and sisters, well, that's... An oxymoron, really, biblically. Jesus even said it himself, you're in deception. And so we realize that not everybody's easy to love because sometimes, you know, even people close to you, you can have a spat, you can have a this or, you know, whatever it is. But that's overcoming. We have disappointments. I know pastor friends of mine, when they got into pastoring, when they started, man, they had dreams and visions. And then they ended up doing a lot of administration and a lot of battles and a lot of all kinds of things. Not what they had on their heart when they first started. They thought the world was going to be saved and well, their area at least. And I think I'm, I've been quite romantic like that and think like a... But then I am a romantic in a, in a lot of ways because I love Jesus with all my heart. 
with all my heart. And I've loved him with all my heart for 35 years. I think that's actually, no, even seven, 35 years, 35 years. And so I started to pray, and this would be last year, Lord, what do you want your church to look like? Where do you want it? Where are you taking it? And I don't mean with the build. I think the build is fantastic. But with us, when I'm talking about the church, the people, the bride, the most beautiful thing on the face of the earth, what do you want to do with us? And, um, and so I was reading a thing that came through. It's Arrow Leadership Course. And um, they send you just monthly, uh, just a, a, a little chat thing by email, and, um, and this lady said that she went to a church, and she asked the pastor how she could pray, and he said, the first thing I'm looking for really is people who will pray, not say they will, but don't, and then if they do pray, that they'll pray fervently, and they'll pray in belief, and I want them to pray for these four things. I want them to pray for courage, holiness, faith, and unity, and I thought, and this article really hit me. And, um, and I began to take it on board. And I began to look at those four characteristics of God and hopefully of Christians. And, but the um, courage, holiness, faith, and unity. I mentioned that at the AGM and um, that that's where I, that I'd been and that's what I'm praying for. And so I'd like to break those four up um, really quickly. Um, because I, I don't want to take too much time and we want to have communion at the end of this. So um, I'm just going to go with, with holiness first. And the, holiness for me is like you, you'll, you'll be a Christian 24 7, not just, not just 24 1, 24 2, 24 3 that it would be 24-7 for every single one of us. I see, uh, and I, in, in 35 years of Christianity, I've not always seen that. And I've seen the right, I, please, I'm not talking, I'm talking mainly here now about people that's, that's past, but in some ways I'm talking about myself as well. It's not all been easy, and it won't have all been easy for you. If you've been a Christian for some length of time, you'll know you've gone through some difficult spaces and things. But at the same time, I could never understand when someone ran off with somebody else. When, when, and I've had a look at that, and I can remember a friend of mine that I was really close to, and this is a long, this is a, I'm talking probably 20 years ago now. And I can, and I can remember I, I was dare shooting with this guy a lot. And on, and on the phone, um, I can remember ringing him up one day and said, you know, look, hey, it's turning southwest tonight, it's going to drizzle, and, and they'll be out uh, tonight, you know, and that, turnip paddock and, and so um, we should be in and at the other end of the phone it's like oh no nah, you know like I got something else on tonight and, and um, oh we never get anything anyway what do you mean we never get anything anyway we hardly even miss out you know and, and there just come excuse after excuse after excuse and, and that was about the last time we were dish. I rang him up a few times. There's always something else on. There was something else on on the weekend. It was something else on if it was a weeknight. And on all that, I didn't know. I had no idea he was having an affair. And, um, and that's what it was all about. And I felt, when I found that out, I didn't know how his wife felt, but I felt totally ripped off. I, f I felt like I didn't know him. I felt like there was somebody else there. I felt, I felt dumb. I, felt, I, um, I just I couldn't work it out. And when I see in the church, I say this at marriages, 
and things that that actually, you know, the divorce rate inside the church isn't that different to out in the world. But there's some key things that, that actually do change it horrendously, amazingly. And one of the things is that, that I'd learnt that actually they did a survey of like when you're together as a couple and all that and what you do together and your, with your Christianity together really matters. And, and here's the thing, it's, it's not getting out and conquering the world. It's not having this great faith. It's not having, what it is having is, is humility. Statistics show that if a couple um, fellowship and go to church together every Sunday, then, then the, the divorce rate goes from instead of 60%, you know, about 40%, drops to about 30%. If we start doing ministry together, the divorce rate's about one in seven. Did you know the divorce rate for people who pray together, even if it's just for one minute, Every day, the divorce rate's about one in a thousand and forty something. It is incredible, and in that is, I believe there's a humility that just says in it all that actually this world's bigger than us, and there's a lot. It can be quite dark, and there's a lot of challenges that come at us, and there's a lot of deceit. There's a lot of because that's what the enemy does. And he fools us into, you know, I've never known anybody that has gotten into an affair, bang, just instant, or anything like that, just off the cuff. Usually the rot sat in a long, long time ago. It's, it happens when you stop listening to your conscience. Years ago, perhaps. It happens when things happen, you don't get things out of your life where the Lord's been prompting you to get them out of your life. It, it happens through simply just disobedience in the little things. And that becomes our culture, that we become disobedient or easily rebellious or, or whatever towards God's word. But you know what? If you're praying together with someone and if you're not married, then if you found a prayer partner that just, even if like it only has to be for a minute to pray for one another, to say, you know what? I don't want to walk in the way of the world. I want to walk in the way of the Lord. I want holiness to be something of my life. And I want to learn. I want to have the courage to change. I want to have the courage to stand up and, 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 and be different. I th um, the next one I want to, um, so there's a scripture here. It's um, John 14, 1 to 3. It's done the, Jesus said this before he Ascended, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, but believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. So Jesus is the way for our eternity. He's, he's preparing a place for our eternity. But in Revelation 19, 7, 9, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory in him, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her. Fine linen means the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Getting yourself ready, that's holiness getting things out of our life that we don't want anymore. And it's like, it's as simple as like, Lord, I give up, I surrender. I want to change my life. I want you to come and I need you to be Lord in every area of my life. When I say that's easy, it's easy to say it. It is increasingly harder for people at times to just, for what you trust in. See, God will give you peace and joy and he gives you that through giving you more of himself because that's the only thing that lasts. That's the only thing that's really true is to have more of God in our life. And so when it comes to, I want to go to the next one and, um, and faith. In Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
It's just incomparable joy that comes when you're in faith and you see God move. Unity is something that I've absolutely cherished since I've become a, um, well, become a senior pastor at least, and I didn't really understand the full value of it. Um, you know, <clears throat> I sort of, I don't want to be talking too much out of turn with other churches and different things, but I have a lot of pastoral friends now after being fifth, oh, over 10 years or something, whatever it is in the ministry. And um, when did I become a pastor, Joy, was it? 2007? Might have been about, yeah, 15 years then in the ministry. And, uh, so I've, I've gained a lot of, I've gained a lot of um, pastoral friends. And I've, I've seen a lot of them go through their struggles, and they've heard some of my struggles, which are my personal, my personal wrestling with things. And, um, and I've seen some leave ministry, even only just this last few months. I've seen them leave ministry years ago. Um, that's not leaving the Lord, not leaving Christianity, but, but stepping back. And a lot of it's been is because that when it comes to trying to get things happen, and I'll take a backward step a little bit here. We know that when we fight spiritual powers and principalities, then when we fight those, that's it. It's a spiritual power. It's a spiritual principality. But if you've been ever doing ministry and it happens around deliverance, you find that those spiritual powers and principalities actually lodge themselves and work through people. Very rarely does it work through anyone in the community. It usually tries to find someone within the church that's got an ambition or, a, or an idea or a stronghold or a, or, or a strong, really strong point of view, and it can be down. It can, it can just be, it's, off, it's often over scriptural issues, so you have this tendency to go towards legalism or to, towards um, over liberal or whatever it might be. And, and the whole thing is to, that, that the enemy wants to do is to try and divide the church. Now, if those spirits actually find someone to work through because they've got a pet thing that they work with perhaps, and you can see this at times happen, but actually if you're going to fight that, and so for me, my biggest fight has been um, what, I, what I thought to be at the time at least, a legalistic spirit. I think legally. I, when I got into real estate, um, when I started to begin to study for my exams and things, I found that actually the one great sadness that I had in life that is that I, that I, that I um, didn't become a lawyer, that I hadn't finished school properly and maybe gone and studied, and I thought, well, was it too late? I'd, I'd actually like to be a lawyer. God save me. I'm glad that never happened, you know, sort of stuff. But my thing was that my heart was wired that way. But I'm with Morris and Miriam, and it's all about freedom. Now, the other thing is that I am terribly unadministrative. I'm ter so I would be a hopeless lawyer. It would just be one of those things. And thanks, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in one of those offices that you see on TV. It's got piles of paper and files, and you know, and you have to be careful so they don't all fall over. That'd be me. That would, that's just me on a on any scale, sort of stuff. But but the thing was, I'm I'm also spontaneous, and I love working with the Holy Spirit. You have to be spontaneous. You have to you have to learn that to flow with the Holy Spirit. I can remember years ago, you know, that that um, that when I was um, I was I was in this church and I was a very young Christian, and I was in the second row, and it was on a Sunday night. Morris used to preach on Sunday nights often, and I came I came down because something was bugging me in my heart, and I just really wanted to deal with it. I was in the second row, and there was nobody in front of me in the first row. And um, it was all wooden pews back then. And so, um, and Morris had asked us to stand. Worship team was playing. He had an altar call, and it was exactly for what I wanted to deal with. 
So there's no need to wait, is there? You know? So I just stepped over the pew and I got down and, and fr- just straight into the altar call. I just climbed over and I was there. And Morris said into the microphone at the time, he said, thank you, Greg, for your spontaneity. I really appreciate it. But what I found, though, is that God works for spontaneity. I'm going to talk about courage shortly. You know, and the biggest enemy to courage, I believe at times, is procrastination. God will ask you to do something, and we need to be able to step in and do it when he's asking, not when we've worked out a safe way, not when we've worked out, yeah, this could possibly come off, and I'm willing to give this a go because the odds might be in the favor of it coming off. That's not faith. That's not faith. And so sometimes... What I've seen with pastors and that, when it's in, in with unity, God's asked them to do something, but the 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 eldership of the church becomes fractured. It means either you got to back off, you haven't spoken into what you want to do well enough, or the church isn't understanding because you got to trust that the body is with you. And. But what often happens is for these pastors is that there's been undermining. From behind, oh, don't worry about that. He'll get over it. He'll change his mind or this or that or whatever or whatever it might be. And so you could be challenging the status quo. You can be challenging things. And if there's no unity, you can't do it. But what I found is that when there is unity in the body of Christ, and I'm not talking about singing a song and holding hands and hugging each other on Sunday morning. That is not unity. That's friendly. That's, that's a lot of things. It's having each other's back all the way through. And I want to say, and I, I really I want to commend the trust and the eldership that have been able to do some go forward in the build and do different things because it's been real unity. And when you go to challenge something, I've, and again, I, don't, I, I want to be careful what we're speaking of here, but Nelson asked us to go up and Nelson Waiwam, will we come up, in and I, and preach on, uh, teach on spiritual warfare? We said, yeah, we come up, and we thought, wow, you know, like, to do a whole week on it, so it better be practical. So let's talk about stuff that's in us, and, um, and stuff that's, uh, how the enemy works, and how we create strongholds that, that we can be completely blind to. And when we got up there, we found out that actually most of the people on the school were divorced and they'd come out of ministry. A lot of them came out of ministry after their divorce. And men, were they open to the Lord just going deep into their lives? And when people are really hungry like that, then deliverance will often flow. And what often came and see, Things look for a place to, 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 to settle into, to grab a hold of the spiritual world. And so it often comes in on betrayal. It often comes in on offense. It often comes in on unforgiveness. It gives it ground. It's, Proverbs says that a curse cannot alight unless it finds a place to find a cause. And these people spoke of things of divided leadership, divided everything. And that's why they traveled from Every, I can say about this because they're on, they've gone back, so they've come from all the other side of the world. Now they've gone back home now. It's time's past. But they come all the way for healing. And when Ed and I talked about the unity we had, they just, like, wow. You know? And when I say we had, I don't mean just between Ed and I. That's a different factor. It's, it's um, the unity we were talking about was within the leadership and within the church and within the congregation. Unity is, is, a, is such a blessing. In, in Psalm 133, and this is the whole psalm, it's three verses. How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil on their head running down on the bed, running down on Aaron's bed, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore, like eternal life. It's like 
see, we, we know this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Unity, you know, God commands a blessing. I tell you what, true unity is so rare. This, this scripture reads like a party to me. It reads like a real celebration. It's like God's got unity at last, unity. You know what? I'm going to celebrate it. I'm going to pour oil out over their heads. And that is like, see, oil represents so much in the Bible. It represents joy and peace. It represents anointing. It, it represents kingship. It represents God's love. It represents his favor. It's like party time. And so to find unity is like we have to, it's something you work at, it's something you need to get an understanding. Oh, that's what it looks like. It doesn't mean you can't have an argument. It doesn't mean you can't have disagreements or seize things differently. But when the crunch comes to the crunch, will we move as one? Will we move as one to share the gospel in this place and not be ashamed of it? When we look at forward to outreaches in the community and whatever we might do, actually, you know what? I'm not going to back back. I'm, I'm all in. What's my part? What can I do? And to hold up, and you might be doing something with somebody that, that actually you've had arguments with and you haven't quite sorted that out. And you know what? There's a plan. I've got to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the sake of the gospel, we're going to get on and we're going to get on and do this. And we're not going to let those things hold, hold it back. That's unity. And it commands a party from God. Get the jug of oil and pour it out because I found unity on my bride. He loves you with a passion. He loves you with his whole heart. There's unity in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that's what he wants to pour out over his church. They had very different tasks. The Holy Spirit didn't come and lay down his life. Jesus did. The Father, the creator of this universe. You see, even in that, I know churches that are split on the Bible. They've thrown Genesis out. You know, can we agree that the Word of God is the Word of God? Start there. Don't, Paul says, don't get into silly arguments about genealogy and this and that and everything else. I made a joke, you know, that I'm not really a local yet. I haven't quite got to the 40-year mark. I should just take it back because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're Greek or Jew or this or that or whatever. Can we be unified in the grace of God that he saved one on every one of us? Every one of us. No one can brag before the Lord. Ephesians 2.8 says, that you got, we got saved by grace so that no one can boast. Meaning we can't, grow, we can't brag because we're smarter than each other. Faith came as a gift to get us across the line to say, Jesus, you're beautiful. So we could adore him. He who came to absorb judgment, that we can look to the Father and go, wow, I just embrace you, Father. We couldn't do that before. I've been in a courtroom and I had a lawyer defend me. And for the record, if you're visiting, it's just I completely um, exonerated 100% in all this. But at the same time, this lawyer had to find out what made me tick so he could represent me. And he's doing the talking for me a lot of the time. And he's trying to pick up who Greg is. Well, Jesus does that when we stand before the Father on Judgment Day. He represents us. He knows us. And he's asking us, can we represent him while we're here on earth? Can you do it united? Can you do it in faith? Can you do it with courage? Nearly forgot, there's a young man here, a budding preacher, I'd say. Mr. Courtley, are you, Re Teresa, are you? I'll find the microphone. Because somebody rang up, Teresa, and said they wanted, they felt they wanted to read a scripture out. And I said, if I'm going to talk about this in my sermon, that'll suit. I wasn't even thinking about it. And it turns out, scripture I'm going to read out. So here's a budding young preacher. 
Jordan. Jordan, is it? Cool. Okay, Jordan. You're going to read out from 1 Samuel, and you're only five. I don't know how you do this at five. I, I don't know if I could tie my shoelaces. Anyway. Oh, you can't see? Do you need? No, no, oh. Have all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. And then dreadly afraid. And then David said to Saul, Let no man hard to fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with these Philistines. Whoa, thank you, Jordan. That's awesome, mate. That's the story. He's reading from um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and the whole chapter is on David and Goliath. And, and um, that's something I very rarely have preached on, but I often make mention of. And rather than read out that whole, it's, it's a stunning chapter, and it's full of types where we can immerse ourselves into. And, and often, we often want to see ourselves as David and um and and we see the enemy well that's that's Goliath that's these the Philistine they represent evil and it's good against evil and and good triumphs and but it it's deeper than that and it goes on a lot of different levels and the one thing that really struck me in this is that for the um I was just thinking it over this week and um, how they lined up, how David and, sorry, the Philistines and the Israelites, they lined up. So here's the enemy, and, and here's, the, here's the church. So if you see the Israelites as the people of God, there's the church. And actually, they've fought the Philistines before. This isn't Saul's first battle. And, um, and out of that, you see, um, David himself, He's, he's, uh, um, he's only a young fella, and he's been out, as you know, and he's been worshipping, and he's been looking after um, his father's sheep. And if you go back even further, when Saul the prophet, sorry, Samuel, was looking to anoint the next king of Israel, he, went, he knew he had to go to Jesse's house, David's father. And when they said, line up all your sons, and I'm going to pour oil, there's that oil, the anointing, then... Um, uh, when I do that, I, God's going to show me which one. And as we know, he's not there. He's, they even had to go out. He's, he's like the runt of the litter almost, you know, like surely it's not David. And, um, and it is David. And here he is. He's grown a little bit and, and everything else. And, and he hears what's happening. How many of you out here would like to never pay tax again? <laughs> How many of you, like, what would... Do you think it's worth taking a risk on something? See, the promise for, for, from Saul was that you will never pay tax again if you can come down and beat this guy in your entire life. Tell you what, I'll even throw my daughter into it as well. You can have her. It's like, wow. It's like to never pay tax again. Guys, I don't know... To never pay tax again in your whole life. I've paid tax all my life. I left home at 16. I got paid $37 a week. And I know I only got about 3 or $4 taken off in tax, but it hurt. That was a lot of smokes, you know, and it really was back then when I was a young fella. And here's David as a young fella starting out in life. You never have to pay tax again. And all of Israel just stood and watched. All of Israel stood and watched. And there's something there. You know what? And life's not so bad as it is. I can pay my tax. I don't have to put everything on the line. You see, we look at it as good and evil, but it's like, I like what Timothy Keller brings out on this. He said, actually, it's about two different types of courage. There's David's courage that comes from the Lord, and there's 
there's Goliath's courage that comes from the world, the one that pumps up, the one that vis- just visualizes it and you can get over it. You know what, David? I've just visualized your bones being cut up and your meat being scattered everywhere to the birds of the earth, done deal, and just pump yourself up. Now he's big and all that kind of stuff, and that's what he's been doing. And then this little fella comes out, and he's like, he's, he's insulted. Because that's what arrogance does. When you get the world's type of courage, you can become quite arrogant. Have you ever heard boxers doing smack talk? They're actually quite nervous and quite scared because they know if they let the guard down, this guy could take their head off. But in the meantime, I'm going to talk smack. I'm going to tell him what I see in my mind's eye, that he's going down and whatever around, and he's doing this and he's doing that. I'm going to take his head off. And Mike Tyson took it to a whole new level. He said some vile stuff. That's the type of thing. And and actually, we don't know what Goliath said, because all of it, because he said that he cursed him in the name of his gods. We don't know what those curses were that he tried to put on David. Whereas David's strength, you see, when he was trying to convince Saul that he'll do it, he said, I've been, I've been out in the field since I was a youth. And at times, bears, lions, they would come and they would steal a lamb. And I'd run and I'd take it out of its mouth. That's it, you know, like to take it out of its mouth. And I don't know if you've ever seen the speed that lions work at, you know, like, they are amazing, this, how quick they are, how quick they can pounce at Pete, you know, and all that. And he said, if it turned around to attack him, he grabbed it by the bear and he struck it on the head and killed it, both the bear and the lion. And then he says this, the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, and he'll deliver me from this Philistine as well. You see, I remember when I got set free and when the Lord delivered me of alcoholism and smoking 60 a day. Now, David could have been killed in an instant. The enemy was just killing me over a longer period of time. And both of us needed to be delivered. And there are people here that need set free or have been set free. Celebrate it. If you need set free, it's coming because the grace of God is for everybody. You know, and... And that's a, a part of it is, is this. This is the type of courage that we need is to say, you know what, is that the Lord himself, that, that he, is, he is all the courage we need. David doesn't want you to look at him and be like David. David was a type of Jesus. He went into the enemy. He slay the enemy. The enemy wasn't ready. The enemy, Goliath, if you go back in Scripture, I think it actually says that a shield bearer was with him, which means Goliath didn't have his shield. So his shield was down because he was so insulted with, with this young fella coming. But God had a different idea, a totally different idea and a totally different outcome. You know, many people in the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I will not worship... I, you know what? I'm going to be a holy person. I'm going to have faith. And if we perish, I'm still not going to bow down to you, O King. I still wouldn't do it. Esther, I'll go. I'll go and talk to the king. I may perish, I may not, but I'm going to go and talk to the king. That's courage, laying down your life for somebody else. See, who gets to brag about, like, oh, well, look at me. I died for that. You can't do that. And when you're in heaven, everything completely changes. It's, wow, have we got a a beautiful place to go to, a beautiful eternity. And as I've looked over this last year, two years, 35 years of being a Christian, you know what I value? I value people that want to walk in a holy way. I value people that want to walk in unity. I value people that have faith and, and don't shrink back to unbelief. I have a propensity to get back into unbelief. And um, 
and people that are in faith lift me forward continually. I've had my fair share of lifting other people forward into faith, but I need lifted into faith at times too. It's a hard road at times. It's a hard road for everybody. That's how we learn, and we learn to, you, to rely on one another. I believe we have a beautiful church, a beautiful body of Christ, and um, as we look to Jesus, who showed us what courage looks like when he, he went to the cross to win freedom for, for you and I, to win healing for you and I, to win our relationship with our Father. He is stunning, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so as we break this bread and we share it this morning, I pray for each and every one of us, for each and every one of us. Father, I pray that 2023, Lord, there'd be broken ground in our hearts. Lord, you would sow in light and you would sow in life and you would sow in, Lord, um, unity and courage. Father, I pray that in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you for what you're doing here in Oxford. I thank you for what you're doing with the church worldwide. Lord, may she grow. May be, she be beautiful like you. May she glow and reflect your glory in Jesus' mighty name. As we take this bread, we eat it, Lord. We pray um, that we understand what it cost at the cross, that your body was broken for us as we drink this cup. We remember the blood that you spilt for us, Lord, that we could walk with you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Would the servers like to come? Bless you heaps. And um, just uh, yeah, take it as you receive it. If you're um, here in families, you might want to take it as a family group. You might have someone sitting beside you that's not with a family. You might like to invite them into your circle. That would be really awesome. Bless you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So just as the music team come back up, um, I just want to remind you of Teresa's word. Um, someone, if you're here and you have a heart condition that you'd like prayer for, um, please just uh, come on up and um, see, or just go straight to Teresa. 
um, or, or come up the front, we'll hunt her out for you. Um, <clears throat> but if there's anything you'd like prayer for going forward, I'm really excited about 2023. I said to Joy this morning, you know, I really feel like there's change. And um, I had a, had a wonderful prophetic word emailed to us um, earlier in the year, and it's that we'd fought, we'd fought, we'd fought and prevailed, and now there's, there's the new um, that would just summarize it. And um, it came out of Genesis about the wells, actually, where they'd, where um, Jacob and that knew they'd fought for the wells of Abraham, but, but uh, um, they, could, they had contention. And, um, but in the end, the last one was called a uh, Hebrew name, but it meant room, that God's going to give us room to grow. And, uh, and they settled in that valley. So would you like to stand? And I'd, I'd just like to, yeah, let's just worship. If you feel like you need prayer.